This is part two of Ephesians 1, 7 to 10. We saw last time that the meaning of redemption in verse 7 is release by payment or freed by ransom. And we said that there are at least three things that we are redeemed from, released from, freed from by payment or by ransom. And one is trespasses. It means the forgiveness of our trespasses. In him, we have redemption. We have release by payment. We have freedom by ransom. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So the first thing we are freed from is the guilt of our trespasses. They are forgiven. Guilt is removed. God forgives through redemption. The second thing was we are redeemed from, freed from, released from the ultimate defects of our body and our soul in resurrection at the end. That's called redemption. And the third thing is that we're redeemed even now from the ongoing power of sin in our lives. So at least three dimensions of release and freedom by payment and by ransom. And I said, we're going to dig into how this actually works. So Father, as we try to understand in this session, how it is that guilt and forgiveness can come about through a payment which releases, a ransom which releases. Help us to see the wonder of this so that we rejoice in our standing as forgiven and exult in the glory of your grace whose riches are the source of it all. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My first clarification is to say, what trouble are we really in when it comes to trespasses? Clearly, trespass means uh, you break a law, you break a rule, and you have guilt because these are God's laws and God's rules, God's ways in the world require us to act a certain way as his creatures. None of us has lived up to those requirements, and therefore we have trespassed, and therefore we are guilty, and therefore we need forgiveness. What really the seriousness of our condition? Because it's implicit in what I'm saying, but we see it explicitly as we go over to chapter 3, I mean chapter 2. And you were dead, so there's a consequence spiritually in our own souls. We were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. This was our very nature to disobey and trespass. Sons means that's in our DNA, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and, and the mind, and were by nature, like sons of disobedience now, by nature, by nature, children of wrath. This is our problem. I mean, it's bad to be guilty. It's bad to be dead. It's horrific to be under the wrath of an omnipotent and just God whose wrath is always in accord with his perfect justice. That's our problem. Or as it says in chapter 5 of Ephesians, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. So here, wrath is connected with the sons of disobedience. And back here in Ephesians 2, the sons of disobedience are by nature children of wrath. So when we say that by redemption, by redemption, God has forgiven our trespasses 
It includes deliverance from his wrath. To be forgiven is to be freed by a ransom or by a payment from wrath, not just guilt, and especially not just guilt feelings. We really were guilty, and we were really under just punishment and wrath, and by forgiveness through redemption, we are rescued. Now, my question is, how does that work? Let's watch Paul unpack it. Romans 8, 3. God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son. All right, here's the key. God sends his son to do what? In the likeness of sinful flesh. So he became a human and had flesh like ours, but it wasn't sinful. It was in like sinful flesh, real flesh, but not sinful flesh. So he became a human being, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He's going to do something with our sin. What? He condemned. So this is God. So by sending his own son, he, God, condemned sin in the flesh. Whose flesh? Christ's. Whose sin? Ours. This is called substitution, right? You don't have to be a rocket science scientist or, or a theologian to see this. God sent his son because sins must justly be condemned. Otherwise, we're all going to go to hell and bear our own condemnation. If God wants to free us by payment, there must be a payment that cancels sin, and sin gets canceled by being condemned, punished. It was punished in his flesh. Jesus died in our place, bearing our condemnation so that our sin was really paid for. That's the first way to describe it. Here's the, the, another way Paul says the same thing. This is even more beautiful. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. How did he do that? Having forgiven us our trespasses. That's the same as Ephesians 1, 7. Having forgiven our trespasses by, here's how he did it, canceling the record of debt. So our sins are debts. We owe God obedience. We don't pay. Therefore, we got to go to jail. We got to go to debtor's prison unless our debts can be canceled. He canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. How did he do it? This he set aside. So this record of debt, all our sins, millions of them, well, thousands. Now, I suppose it would be millions if you're as old as I am. And you count every whiff of attitude or thought or intention set aside. How? Nailing it to the cross through the hands of Jesus. So that's how he did it. Jesus is the payment. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life, his life as a ransom for many. So when we say that redemption is released by payment, the payment is the life of Jesus poured out through his blood. This is through his blood, through his death, through the pouring out of his life, the giving up of his life for us, that, that we are freed by his ransom. We are released by his payment. Now, one last step. To whom was the payment made? What was the transaction that really took place? Some people have tried to say that the payment was made to the devil. That's crazy. In fact, virtually blasphemy, perhaps. Let's watch this in Romans 3, 23 to 26. All have sinned, committed trespasses, and fall short of the glory of God. That's the essence of sin, is that we fall short of the glory. That is, we, we exchange the glory of God for 
other things, as chapter 1, verse 23 says, of Romans. And so we belittle the glory of God and are justified, so we are forgiven and set right by His grace as a gift through the redemption, that's Ephesians 1, 7, that is in Christ Jesus. Now, how does redemption happen? And Paul says it happens by propitiation. What is propitiation? Let's write it here. Propitiation is payment to God to satisfy and remove his just disfavor, or you could say his just wrath, a payment to God to satisfy and remove his just disfavor. So if you ask, how does redemption work? Actually, when a payment is made, the payment is made to God. Here's, notice, God put Christ forward as a propitiation. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. It happens through the redemption, through a payment that frees that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward. So God made the payment, and he made the payment, how? By his blood, he sent his son to shed his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. So all these these. God belittling sins up here, God had for years seemed to just pass over as if you could just justify any old body who has faith in Jesus and it wouldn't matter. That appeared unrighteous. God would be unrighteous if people could just have their sins swept under the rug by believing in Jesus. No, Jesus had to pay a price in order to demonstrate the righteousness of God. Let's just read it. This was to show. So putting Christ forward as a payment to God to satisfy his disfavor, a propitiation, putting Christ forward, this was to show God's righteousness, that he does not just sweep sins under the rug. He vindicates the way he upholds the value of his glory. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins, and it looks like he didn't care, and he cares infinitely, which is why he sent Jesus Christ into the world to bear the punishment for our sins, because if they went unpunished, it would look as though God were unrighteous because he would be not owning up to the value of his glory. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who merely has faith in Jesus. This is incredibly glorious. So at the root of redemption, in him we have redemption through his blood. This is the gift this is the payment. And the payment is made not to the devil. The payment is made by God to God in the sense that the shedding of Jesus' blood is the bearing of a just punishment for all the sins of all the redeemed so that all the apparent unrighteousness of God in passing over those sins is removed. It is vindicated. So at the bottom of redemption is propitiation. Remember the definition, the payment to God to satisfy and remove his just wrath or his just disfavor. This is a great redemption, a great forgiveness, a great satisfaction by the son's blood of God's own 
righteousness, and thus we are freed by that ransom and released by that ransom from our trespasses and from God's wrath.